Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, the lecturer for our short course on, uh, um, well, on uh, data compression and some theoretical results uh, resulting from that, uh, 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 Dr. Artur Jesz. So uh, he's a professor at the University of Wroclaw in Poland. And uh, well, he's going to speak about an area which is somewhere between string algorithms and theoretical computer science. So in fact, these are algorithms, but these algorithms led to some significant progress in purely theoretical questions. And, uh, and Professor Yesh became famous with these results. He was, giving, uh, he was giving invited talks at the top conferences in theoretical computer science. And right now, well, he fortunately agreed to give such a lecture course to well, uh, well, to us, just this is an extended version, uh, well, in which he will present the main ideas behind his line of research. And let me also state that many, many years ago, Arthur was my student and we collaborated on the subject of formal grammars, but that was, that was a long time ago. These were really good results in my opinion. But the things that Arthur did after that have really suppressed uh, his PhD work. So, and that's what we are, uh, that's what we are going to hear about uh, today and, and in the following day. So, uh, well, yes, you're welcome. Please start. So thank you, Alexander, for the kind introduction. Thank you for inviting and, <coughs> and hosting the lecture. Um, <coughs> it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, so if anybody has any questions at any point, just please interrupt me. I'm trying to make those um, as close uh, to a real uh, real life uh, lecture as possible, which may result in some uh, unexpected behavior. Okay, so what those lectures will be about. So the, the line of research that Alexander talked about, I will, in general, I will tell that this is uh, focused about the recompression technique. And the idea is that this is something which applies very generally to uh, data, which is somehow compressed or given in, a, in an implicit way. And the compressed can mean that this is like a grammar based compre uh, compressed using some formal grammars or implicit in the sense that your data or is given as a solution to a word equation, meaning that it is somehow represented, but it is given to you not in a, in a plain form, but somehow compressed or hidden from you. And the usual way that people are uh, trying to do algorithm, algorithm in such things is they're trying to find some combinatorial properties of the solutions to word equations or to the words defined by formal grammars and then exploit those combinatorial properties and then make the algorithms for those problems. However, what we will uh, focus on in this compression technique is that not uh, on the combinatorial properties of the data, but rather on the combinatorial properties on the way they are they're defined. So the, the way the, those word equations are defined, so actually on the, on the way they are written or on the way those formal grammars are defined. So not on the actual combinatorial object, those are words or trees or something like that, but rather on the way they are represented. And it turns out that this is quite fruitful. And this led to several algorithms. So somehow a unified approach led to several um, results. This applies to word equations, both in uh, free semi-groups or in free groups. If you do not know what it is, then just word equations should be uh, what you remember. You can extend those. The algorithms are pretty, well, more or less straightforward. So they can be extended so that you also allow, allow some constraints so that you can restrict your case your instances and look at some restricted word equations like with one variable equations, and this still applies and gives some good, good algorithms. Uh, you can generalize from words to some more complex things like, for instance, uh, terms, and you consider the equations over terms, and this is what's usually known as context unification. Or you can uh, make it much more specific and look at the grammar compression in which you define the, the, uh, your data using some formal grammars which can be seen as a special cut of word, word equations. And again, this technique applies there. In particular, you can look at some questions about this grammar compression, like um, pattern matching or uh, equivalence for, uh, for such grammar compressed uh, strings. And again, this technique is applicable. So we begin with word equations because this is perhaps the most striking 
example of the application, but it also uh, allows to present this whole technique in a more, in a usually in a unified way. So what is a word equation? So let me just at the beginning give some informal introduction. There will be definitions later on. So we have some a word equation. You, you should think that this is a, something written like u equals w, uh, v, where those things uh, contain both u and v contain some variables and letters. So for instance, a, b, x, y, a equals y, z, a, x, or something like that. And this formalism was uh, considered mostly because it was known quite early. Uh, and in this problem, you ask whether this such a word equation or system of such word equations have a solution. And it was known for quite, uh, quite early that uh, this reduces to Hilbert's 10 problem. So in Hilbert's 10 problem, you are given Diophantine equations. Diophantine equations. So the idea was, and this was developed in Russia somewhere in the 60s, that in order to show that Hilbert's 10 problem is undecidable, which it which is, then we would like to show undecidability of word equations, which are somehow simpler and perhaps it's easier to attack those this easier intents. And we know that it indeed the Hilbert's 10 problem is undecidable, and this was uh, shown by Matiasevich, but using a completely different approach. And this is for a reason, because it turns out that the word equations satisfiability of word equations is decidable. And this was shown by McCannin in 77. And this <coughs> and his algorithm was um, widely known and appraised. But on the other hand, uh, and this was state of the art for the for this and related equations for for several years. In particular, it was extended to to free groups and it was extended to traces. <coughs> at, at the same time, this was the al only algorithm known for this problem. Okay, so, uh, and this algorithm was, it is extremely complex. So firstly, what it actually does is complex, but also the analysis is involved and the obtained computer, um, computational complexity of the algorithm is also very high. On the other hand, what we only know about the word equations is that they are NP-hard. So the best, know, best known lower bound is just the NP-hardness, which is far away for, uh, for the mechanics algorithm, I think the, the best the best variant which is known is x uh, is in exponential space. Okay, so in seventy seven, this algorithm was given, and for many years the progress was done just by improving some tiny bits of this algorithm and by some local modifications or some changing some some parts of it. And <clears throat> what changed is what that in the late nineties it was realized by Plandowski and Ritter. Uh, that you can apply the compression to the words equation. Well, I will show the results in a moment. It's re relatively easy. The idea, uh, but how to summarize this is that if you're giving as given a solution to a word equation, then it can be encoded very very efficiently. So if you look at the length minimal solution, whatever it means, minimal in some sense, then it can be encoded roughly in the logarithmic size. So if the solution size, so the length of the substitution for all the variables is capital N, then this is more or less logarithm, logarithmic in N, well, times the equation size, or well, roughly speaking like that. Okay, so the, well, this one is, is small, so this is actually the, the large thing, okay? So the solution size is usually large. So we, Plandowski and Ritter showed that you can encode the, the solution using, in just logarithmic size of the actual solution size, at least for the length minimal ones. Okay, so what the algorithm can do, well, non-deterministic algorithm can do is to guess the encoding of the of the variables, which we know is just logarithmic, and then substitute it to the equation, and well, then verify the whether it's true, uh, whether this is indeed a solution or not. Of course, uh, this doesn't apply to every possible compression because you could realize it could be that this compression is somehow ineffective. But what they showed is that this compression method they used is effective in the sense that they can check this equality in polynomial time uh, on the size of the actual substitute, uh, on the size of the representation, uh, polynomial in the representation size. Okay, but in a sense, this algorithm was, this was of course a new approach and they showed a new avenue, but this was pointless in the sense that the only way they could get the bound on N was using the McCannins algorithm 
And at the times when they showed it, this was four times exponential and it was shortly afterwards improved to three times exponential. So their algorithm was essentially, well, doubly exponential for the, um, it was doubly, exponent, uh, doubly exponential. And it was still worse than, than the best ex, uh, implementation of the McCannins algorithm, which was ab available at that time. But the, the crucial point was that they showed that there is some connection to compression, which can be uh, used uh, for, for word equation. Okay, and soon afterwards, like in 99, Plandowski gave a doubly exponential bound on N. Okay, so doubly exponential bound on, on N. And this already improved the bound which was given by McCannins algorithm and could be used in well, the algorithm of Plandowski and Ritter. And this were, those were two different, somehow different things. They were based on similar ideas, but those were different. So the algorithm and the, and the bound. And if you manipulate it with them, if you, well, if you play it with them uh, enough, then you could actually show that they fit together well. And he, in the end, he gave, Plandowski gave a p-space algorithm for this problem. And this is the best result uh, till today, okay? So we do not know if, if any better algorithm than p-space is known. So again, the best lower bound is NP-hardness. Um, okay, so we do not know exactly where this problem lays between somewhere between NP and, and p-space. Okay, and what I will be talking about is that, uh, maybe one word again, is that uh, and again, the algorithm of Plandowski, which was given in 99, then it became a new standard. So what was happening for the next couple of years is that it was extended to, to free groups, to some other groups, to, to traces, to many other settings. But again, this was the, the new standard which was available. And the next change, which was perhaps not as big as the previous one, was that uh, yours truly gave in 2012 gave again a p-space algorithm, so the same complexity as Plandowski, but this time it's much slim, simpler in the sense that I hope to give the proof in say 40, 45 minutes. And so the proof of Plandowski is not, I mean, you can read it as like 10 pages of, of proof, but it's still quite condensed. It's not, not so easy to, to say why exactly this goes in this way, but the, the proof that I'm going to present it's relatively, it's believed at least by me and some colleagues <laughs> that it's much simpler than the previous one. Okay, so that's the introduction for today's lecture. So <clears throat> let us fix some notions just to be sure that uh, we're on the same page. Okay, so uh, the word equations will be about, so they will contain some uh, letters, constants and variables. So I will use the sigma for the alphabet of letters. So this is alphabet of letters. Alphabet of letters. Now we'll denote them by some small capital letters like A, B, C, and so on. There are some variables. I will denote them by capital letters. If it's really needed, then I will write some callig calligraphic X to denote the variables, but hopefully I will not need any notions. And of course, those two sets are disjoint. Okay, so sigma and x, those two sets are disjoint. Okay, and the word equation is just given as a u equals uh, v, where both of those contain some letters and variables. I'll give some examples in a moment, but just let me uh, <coughs> formalize all those notions. And of course, we can look about system of word equations, which contain several equations of this form, and so on up to some k1. But in fact, we will not, okay? So this is not important because all of those can be encoded. So if you have a system of word equations, then you can encode them into one using some simple encoding. Okay, so from now on, I will usually talk about the algorithm for, for one word equation, sometimes in the example. So it will be nicer to have a system of word equations, but it's enough to, to give the algorithm for one word equation. Okay, so this, since this is an equation, then we have a substitution which somehow tries to make this equation a, a true equality. So the substitution, which I will denote by small s, it just assigns the variables with some words. Okay, and I will usually assume that it's slightly better to assume that uh, the variables are not, we cannot uh, assign empty words. Okay, though this is okay, but somehow problematic. So I will try to, uh, Formally, we allow it, but it's better not to use it. 
Okay, sometimes we will uh, also allow the solutions to use somehow a larger alphabet. Okay, so that we have a larger alphabet than just the letters which are available initially. But this is a small technicality, it has no effect on anything. Okay, so the substitution substitute variables by letters. And of course, we uh, it's good to extend it also not to just single variables, but to strings. Okay, so we extend it to letters of the of sigma by saying that it's, that's the same. And we extend it to sequences by saying that, well, we, when we apply it on the sequence, then that's the same as, as on alpha, as on beta. So we extend it as a homomorphism. Okay, so we just apply it symbol by symbol. And for, for letters, it's, it's the same. So it's the same letter. And for the variables, we have some pre-described, we have some values which we substitute for the variables. And S is a solution of a word equation if, it, if, it, if it's true that S on U is the same as S on V. Okay, so that's a natural definition. And the length minimal solution. So uh, in many arguments, it's better to somehow assume that those uh, S on U has some nice properties. And those, well, I will define later what's the, what are the nice properties, but it's usually better to look for, at the shorter solution because then they somehow behave nicer. There are many different notions that we can define what does it mean uh, shorter. So let's say that with the length minimal solution, it is the one which minimizes the total length. Okay, so the, the total length of the obtained string is uh, is minimal possible. It, that's not the, it's that this does not necessarily imply that this is the unique solution. Okay, so there can be many length minimal solutions in general. And uh, it's often more uh, practical not to look at the word equation and the, and the substitution for the single variables, but at the word that you actually obtain at the end. Okay, so this S on U, which I considered here, then this, this, the solution word, so when we are given a solution, when S is a solution, then the solution word is the S applied to, to U. Okay, so the, I've already considered it in a, one line above, so using this notion of solution word, then the length minimal solution is the one which minimizes the length of the solution word. Okay. And the problem that we are going to investigate is the satisfiability of word equations, or simply, I will sometimes say word equations. So we are given a word equation or a system of such equations, and we want to decide whether it has a solution. So whether we can, uh, does there exist a, so a substitution which makes all those formal equal, uh, equation, equalities into true, true equality of strings. Okay, so this is a decision problem. Decision problem in the sense that we want a yes or no answer. Uh, but this is more or less the same. So all the, al all the algorithms which give you a yes, no, well, maybe not all, but all we will consider, which give you a yes, no answer, they actually even solve the problem in the sense that they give some representation of the solution, um, of the solution, one of the solution. Asking for the representation of all solutions is a different problem, which is somehow more difficult. So in some cases, it's, um, it's different in the sense that the computational complexity is different or that the methods are, it might be slightly more involved to, act, uh, to ask for the representation of all solutions. Let me just change the color. I guess that, that one is not that great. Okay, so let us look at some examples. Okay, so this is a simple equation. This is an uh, AX CI equals AB YA. So you could see that we can cancel this leading A because it has no effect on anything. This one also has to be the same as this one. So that's the same equation as writing XC equals BY. And you could see that for instance, this uh, the substitution S on X equals B, S on Y equals uh, C, that this is a solution. It's also length minimal one. And that's not the only solution. We could also apply, you could also look at solutions of the form S on X, some S prime equals BW, uh, S prime on Y equals uh, WC. And those also would, uh, those also are solutions for any, for any W. Okay, and the solution word in this case is simply 
well, looking at this original equation, this is A, B, C, A. Well, in this case, in the second case, this is A, B, W, C, A. <coughs> okay. Uh, another example, this is a standard solution which is used to show that we can somehow encode Diophantine equations. So when you when we write AX equals XY, then it's easy to show that the, all the solutions of this equation is of the form A to K. Well, the first letter is A and here the first letter also needs to be A. So by some simple induction, uh, we conclude that all the letters that we substitute for X need to be A. So yeah, this is the only form of the solution that we can get. And whether it's for k greater or equal or to greater than zero, it depends whether we allow the uh, the, z, the entry substitution or not. And the length minimal substitution would be a or epsilon, depending on whether we allow this epsilon or not. And the solution word in such cases are well, a squared or, or a. OK, uh, this is again a simple equation. It can be easily seen that, well, this is a solution. We, just, we can substitute anything for y and then uh, for x, and then y is simply a substitution for x, <coughs> b. <coughs> okay, the last solution, uh, the last equation that, well, maybe not the last, the last on this page that we consider is that here we can see that this is somehow an encoding of some others uh, of two different equations. So if we look at those parts, then those two are of the same length, regardless of uh, what are the what is the substitution for uh, for x and y. We will always have that those two things are of the same length. So this is actually equivalent to a system of a x y equals x y a and x to three equals y squared. And from the from the first one, we can show that s on x and s on y they need to substitute some words or well, sequences of A's. And the second one, so S on X is simply A to some small x, S on Y is A to some small y. And the second equation um, ensures that uh, three times the length of X, so three times small x equals the same as two times the length of small y. Okay, so the solution is of the form uh, well, s on x equals a to uh, two k, and s on y equals a to three k. Well, for some k greater or equal than zero. Okay, and then the one with minimal k uh, is the one <coughs> is the length minimal one. Okay. Uh, Again, this will be the last equation that we consider. Here again, we can cancel this, this b. And now, uh, if you think about if we if we exclude epsilon, so the empty substitution, then the only thing that we can do is that this b a is the one here. So this is substitution for x, and this could be the substitution for y uh, for y. Okay, so s on x equals b a a a, and s on y equals b b a. So maybe some simple equation. Uh, it's not so easy to give example, non-trivial like, uh, examples of equations which do not have a solution. But let's say if we have anything of this form so that the first letters are different, then this doesn't have a, a solution. And in general, it's not so easy to define anything that uh, doesn't have a solution. Okay, uh, so let me come back to this uh, remark that we do not assign epsilons to variables. So in general, if we if in the input we allow it, then what we can do is we can guess which variables are assigned the empty word and then just remove them from the instance. Okay, which means that uh, we can NP reduce this input uh, input instance to the one which doesn't uh, allow epsilon in the solution. And this is, will be mostly the, the thing that we are working on. So if you do not know what's an NP reduction, so let's just say that we could try out all the possibilities, what's assigned epsilon and what not. So uh, in the, later on, we will just consider the instances of the problem in which we do not assign epsilon to, to any variable. So at the beginning of the lecture, I've told you that this uh, algorithm will be a p-space algorithm. 
So let me just uh, mention what does it mean, just in case that somebody doesn't know. So a p-space algorithm is an algorithm which uh, works in a bounded in a polynomially bounded space. So it doesn't really matter what's the exact model, whether this is a Turing machine or some uh, pointer machine or anything else. You, your space is going to be uh, polynomially bounded. Moreover, we allow non-deterministic choices in the sense that our algorithm can from time to time choose one of the several uh, or one of the options and the idea is that if uh, if the instance is positive so if the if this word equation is satisfiable then for some of those choices we will get a yes answer so the algorithm will eventually say yes and if the well not eventually at some for some of those choices it will say yes and if the instance is negative then for whatever choices it it will make it will always lead to they will always lead to a negative answer so to a no or perhaps it will loop forever so there will be no answer at all and uh, for those who do not know the notions then this is a good notion of the computation in the sense that since those the space is polynomially bounded then it means that we could list all the possible configurations of the algorithm and then just mark that you can go from this one to this one, you can go from this one to this one, and from this one to this one, and, and so on. There could be many outgoing arrows because, because of the uh, non-determinism, and of course there could be many inco incoming ones. There is a starting position, or well, the starting configuration, and some of those are the, the yes, and some are the no, in the sense that some in some of those the algorithm turns yes, and in some no, and we could just walk on this graph list all those positions. There are only exponentially many since the space is polynomially bounded. And then we can look whether there is a path from the start to the one of those <coughs> nodes, which is marked with yes. And if there is one, then it means that we accept. OK, so we can translate from this notion of polynomially bounded computation into a more usual one. But from a computational complexity point of view, this this is a, a finer notion. So what I described below is a slightly larger class than just saying that the space is polynomially bounded. Uh, moreover, I will give the polynomial bound uh, just on some of the executions of the algorithm. So uh, I'm not saying that every possible execution will be polynomially bounded, but only the ones that I will somehow consider and perhaps the other ones they will use an arbitrary space. But this is okay because since this bound will be explicit, so I will tell you that we can use at most 6n squared plus 2n plus 1 <coughs> space and this is the space used, be used by the algorithm. So then we can add to the description of the instance, we can add some special counter. Uh, well, sorry, not the counter. Um, we can write the six and squared plus n plus one separately next to the instance. And if at any point this, um, well, the description of the instance will be larger than this, our bound, which will be explicit anyway, then we can just reject. Okay, so there is no reason for the algorithm to actually remember that it shouldn't exceed this space because we can preprocess it later on. Okay, so I will give the polynomial bound for the space usage on some of the runs of the algorithm, the, the ones that actually lead to the, to the solution. So the other ones, well, they are not going to lead anywhere, so it's fine to terminate them. <coughs> uh, so let us move to this compression uh, standards that we are going to use. So uh, for those are just the context free grammar, but for the historical reasons, they are called strain light programs or SLPs for short, like S, L, and P for the starting letters. And this is, as said, exactly a context free grammar that generates a unique string. Okay, so this is a compression in the sense that uh, what is written defines exactly one, exactly one word, exactly one string. I will be using the word and string interchangeably. To, well, they're more, they're the same. <clears throat> so, for instance, we can look at non-terminal x goes to y, y, y goes to a, z, and z goes to d, b, d, and d goes to a letter c, and then we can show the note 
<clears throat> we can find out what exactly X defines. So Z defines C, B, C, Y defines A, C, B, C. So then X defines A, C, B, uh, C. That, that, that's not true. Uh, squared. Okay, so then, then it's written again. <clears throat> and of course, uh, the representation size will be the, well, the sum of sizes of the of the right hand sides and uh, and I will denote it by well by the size of the uh, well this is the size of the SLP and in general it could be that this is exponential okay so the uh, defined word is well in principle it's exponent uh, the, the only bound that we could give is that it's exponential in the size of the of the SLP and it's relatively easy to to show such bounds. So we can just give that x zero is y and x i plus one is x i x i, and then every consecutive uh, variable on our terminal defines a string which is two times longer. So the the size of the defined word could be exponential in principle. Okay, although in any practical case it's just polynomial or even just a slightly slightly smaller than than the actual data but in principle it's exponential okay uh, without loss of gen we can use of course the chomsky normal form so we can assume without loss of generality that all the pro all the productions are either x goes to a letter or x goes to a concatenation of two non-terminals and we can even order the non-terminals just by assigning them some explicit number and saying that uh, well, the non-terminals on the right-hand side have smaller indices than the, than the one that they de um, define. Okay, and as usually, the transformation to a Chomsky normal form increases the size of the SLP just um, of the context through gamma, so the SLP in our, of, in our case, just by a constant factor. And the, on one hand, it's, well, it's usually easier to work with them, but also in such a case, we can say that the size of the as, uh, of this SLP is just two times, it's not more than two times of the number of non-terminals. So we can some, have two alternative notions of the size. This would be either the total sum of the right-hand sides or the number of non-terminals. Non and then when this is in Chomsky normal form, this is more or less the same up to some uh, small, small constant. And the, so later on, uh, the, the algorithm of Plandowski is based, well, not based, as, as, as the last step, it uses the fact that we can check the equivalence of SLPs. So the context free grammar do not define the word uh, uniquely in the sense that you can have two different SLPs that define exactly the same word. And it's not so obvious how to check whether they indeed define the same word, but this can be done. For instance, since we know that they are exponential, that the defined word are exponential, then we can just try to find out symbol by, well, position by position, whether they define the same um, letter. And this works in p-space because we need to iterate over exponentially many positions. But in fact, we can, this can be done in, in polynomial time. And I will give an algorithm for that in a couple of lectures, I think three lectures from, from now on. Okay, but it's enough to know that this can be done in, in polynomial time. Um, okay, so the SLPs are nice because then they can uh, compress things even exponentially. But the problem is that if we want to work the, with them, then they do not support the substring that well. So that if you have some non-terminal A and it defines some word, then sometimes you would like to cut out this part. And then this is a slight problem because you do not have access to this directly. And uh, this could be like in between two non-terminals and you need to define a special SLP for that. And this is usually, and this of course can be done, but this is usually uh, taken care of by uh, considering a slightly more uh, general notion of composition systems. So those are just SLPs as we define them in a moment, but we allow a slightly more involved construction on the right hand side. So if we have a production, then you also we also allow things like that this is an non-terminal B starting from some position up to some other position. Okay, and there could be another non-terminal there. Okay, so in the 
in the rules of this SLP, we can cut out uh, substrings of, of, of existing node terminals. Okay, and otherwise it should still be the same that we do not have any loops and exactly one string is defined. <coughs> and this notion looks well, slightly more stronger than the SLPs, but in fact, it's almost the same in the sense that we can transform, of course, any SLP is a composition system because it doesn't use this extra feature, but we can transform any composition system uh, into an SLP with all, at most quadratic <coughs> increase of size. And this can be shown relatively easy. Page, uh, okay. Uh, because when you think that you have a, a rule for the composition system. Again, without loss of generality, they can be given in uh, Chomsky normal form. And you have some interval to, to which you refer. Then what you can do is that you look at this, uh, then when you look at B, then it has some other production B prime, B double prime and this interval. So there are two words which are somewhere there, and then you have the interval which you cut out. It could be in one word, or it could be in two. And what you need to, sh <coughs> what you add is that you add a separate, you think that you add a, a special separator at the end of any such interval. So if you, recursively. So if you have uh, uh, this interval from B to E, then you look at the word which is defined by, by, this, by B, and you look that this is the interval which is cut out, and you add those two, uh, you add those two ends in this word, and you look down to the uh, to the non-terminal, which is, of course, the rule for B is defined using two non-terminals. And you look, and you take those two ends which you defined in this non-terminal down. So again, there is a rule for B prime, and now you take those two ends that you you have defined there. You look where where they are defined using again in B. B is cut in two using its its rule into two parts, and you take those parts down, and so on. So now, when you, um, how many such different? The question is how many such different uh, separators can be in one non-terminal? So you have two non two. Ha you have just two such separators, and each time when you move with one of those, well, with one you have one and and, and the other, and each time when you go down, then you need to. You, you cannot go with the same separator in one non-terminal twice. So uh, each time when you go down, you go down the SLP. So you can, uh, in every non-terminal, each separator coming from each of those rules can appear at one, at most once. At most once, so you have at most M occurrences, well, two M, uh, if there are M rules, you can have at most two M different occurrences of those ends. Uh, inside in the definition of the, the definition of the, uh, well in the word for the non-terminal, so we can cut it into two m parts, and then uh, every non-terminal well, it's by some easy induction every non-terminal can be obtained by concatenating those well one of those uh, a sequence of such parts. So this is, gives you essential. Okay, so you. You can split one non terminal into two M new ones. So you have two M squared new non terminals. And then the rule for every non terminal can be including this uh, sequence to which, which, it, to, uh, which it uses. It can be obtained by concatenating a couple of other those non terminals down. So it, this can be defined using at most M other non terminals. Okay, so in total, you, we get just two uh, <coughs> m squared non-terminals times m for the, each of the definitions. You, we get a cubic, a cubic bound, and if you work with that a little harder, you, you can see that this actually gives you a, a, a quadratic bound. Uh, sorry. Okay, so we move on to Plantowski's algorithms. There are five minutes, so it should be just okay to to say it. Uh, so. Uh, when we look at the word, we are moving to word equations now. Okay, so uh, when we are giving a solution, so a solution is given, 
So a cut in the solution uh, is the position between a letter and or a variable. So th this is the place that you can observe in the in the equation. Okay, so we, we look at the solution word as it is defined, and we look at the places where, where variable end. So for instance, this is the x, with, this is the substitution for this x, and we look at the position at which it ends, and also for the letters which are in the equation and the positions on, what, on which those letter ends. Okay, on one side of the equation and of the other. Uh, for instance, if we have this equation a x y x to three equals a uh, x y a y to three y to two, the solution would assign s to x with a square of y with a to three. Then on the left hand side, this is like a a a, a uh, that's for x a a a that's for y, and then again six a's. Oh, uh, this is for x, for x, and for x, and the same word on the left-hand side. So, a, a for x, a, a, a for y, and then again, six a's for y and y. And the cut here would be all of those places, which are in between the substitution for x, for y, and for different copies of x, or in between the letter and those substitutions, and the same here. Uh, there's also a single x here, there's a single a here. Okay, so those are the cuts uh, of the equation. And <clears throat> of course, there is a linear number of cuts because, well, each cut is associated with a position uh, in the, it's between two positions of the uh, letters and variables in the word equation. Uh, Okay, I'm a bit slower than I thought, but maybe, okay, just this part. Um, so I would like to say that those cuts define position, some nice positions in the word, and this will be defined in the sense that uh, if something is not around the cut, then this can be somehow removed from the equation. So for a function, uh, for technical reasons, it's better to, to, to fix the length that we assign to variables. Okay, so uh, we list the variables and we say what are the lengths for, um, of the substitution for the variables and the solution will be well, compatible with, with this function f or just an f solution if it indeed uh, assigns uh, variables with words on that length. And so, and when we fix the length, then we can say uh, what are equivalent positions uh, in the solution word. Okay, so if there is a, there is an equation and there are two different occurrences of x, then we know that the letters which are on the same, which are in the equivalent position in the substitution of x, then of course they have to be, the, uh, they, of course they have to be the same, okay? So if we substitute x on both sides, then this has to be the same. And also the letters which are on the same position in the equation, they also have to be the same. And this position is uniquely defined when we say what are the lengths uh, of the substitution for x. Okay, so this correspondence, this uh, correspondence R is uniquely defined by saying what are the length of the equation uh, of the substitution for the variables. And then we expand this uh, relation to, uh, well, a transitive, reflexive and symmetric one. So we look what, which letters in the equation need to, need to be the same. Fine, so we have this relation which says that two, well, defines by, positions in the uh, in the solution word or in the in the variable and of course if we have any th solution which is compatible with this f so the f gives you the length then if there are any two positions which are in this relation then of course those two uh, positions needs to have the same letter because they correspond either to the same letter at some given position in the equation or it's a given position in the in the variable and we look at the transitive closure. So of course those two have to be the same. Moreover, if uh, we, as we, we calculate this F solution on the whole solution word and if there is one equivalence class which contains two positions, uh, if, if any, uh, 
sorry, we can uh, compute this equivalence class. And of course, there are some constants in the equation, which are in the same, some of them could be in the same equivalence class. And if you compute that there is a constant A and B in the same equivalence class, then of course this is, we cannot, this equation is not satisfiable, but this is the only reason why there shouldn't be an F, F solution. So if there is no such an uh, occurrence that two different constants are in the same equivalence class, then this equation is satisfiable. Okay, and lastly, <clears throat> that if we want to look at the, this requires some proof, but essentially we could fill every, uh, this says, t tells us what should be the letter uh, at every of those equivalence classes. So if there is a constant that we give this constant, that there is, it, this, this equivalence class, then it doesn't have any constant that we can fill it up with an arbitrary constant, just choose A for every <clears throat> such equivalence class. And lastly, uh, if there is an, length minimal solution. So what should happen is that if we have an equivalence class, then there should be a constant in this equivalence class. Because otherwise we could just fill this equivalence class with epsilon and this still would be a valid solution. Uh, this wouldn't be an F solution. So the length of course changes when we substitute epsilon for this letter, uh, for, those, uh, for every letter in this equivalence class. But since this, this is the whole equivalence class, then if we look at corresponding letters in the equation, then to the left, they have the same number of epsilons and to the, well, of those instances that are replaced by the epsilon and to the right, the same. So this equation will be still well-defined and the, well, the substitution will be still well-defined and the same that's the, for the substitution for the variable. So in every instance of the substitution for the variable, we would delete the same number of letters in each of those substitutions. So also the, what we are doing, we are actually defining a new substitution and a new solution word, which is shorter because we have deleted some, some letters. Okay, this requires some, some simple arguments, but that's okay. And from that we can uh, show, and this again requires some argument, but it's relatively easy induction, that if we have a length minimal solution and we have some word which is somewhere in the solution word, we think we, that it's within the substitution for a variable, then there has to be another, uh, another occurrences of occurrence of this substring W which touches a cut. So there is a, uh, crosses a cut here. So there is a cut somewhere in between this other occurrences of, of the substring W. And the reason for that is <clears throat> because otherwise, why if there is no such cut, then we could just uh, for every letter which is inside this W, we could travel all across this uh, equivalence class. And we, if there is no cut found anywhere next to this letter, then we could take exactly the same for every letter of this W in parallel. And every copy of this W is inside some string, string X. And we could just delete this whole substring W from the, the whole equivalence class. Okay, this requires some, some simple argument, but it, <coughs> This requires some simple inductive proof, but the idea, I, I think it should be <coughs> relatively easy that we, that if, if it's no one, uh, if there is no cut inside, then it means that all the letters which are there are from those equivalence classes that we described earlier, that they have no, um, no letters which are explicit in the equation. Okay, and this is already what we need to define the, the, the plan, Ritter and Pladowski proof. So, we will, I will define the cuts using, the note cuts using some Greek letters, alpha, beta, gamma, and so on. And let alpha k uh, be the substring that we look at the cut number alpha, and we look at the, uh, well, two to k letters around this alpha. So two to k minus one letter to the left and two to k minus one letters to the right. Okay, it could be that the equation ends earlier. So then we of course cut at this. <coughs> uh, if the solution word ends earlier, then of course we cut at that place. So when we look at this cut alpha k plus one, so of length two to k plus one, so it's centered around this alpha. Okay, so inside there is this smaller cut of the smaller number. So alpha k plus one, it's somewhere somewhere here, and there are some substring to the left and to the right, okay? There is some WK 
uh, sorry, it should be like that. There's some substring W to the left and some substring W K prime to the right. However, when we look at length minimal solution, then this WK and WK plus one, they have length at most, uh, this is two, two K plus one, this is two, two K. So this is at most two, two K minus one. This is at most two, two K minus one. <clears throat> so both of those substring, they appear somewhere else in the equation at some, around some cut. So uh, the, they cross a cut, so there is a cut inside. So this WK, <clears throat> is some beta k uh, at some positions. It has length at most two to k minus one. So even if it's if, even if the cut would be at the very end, it would still fit in some other. Well, in this cut of length two to two to k, so two to k minus one and two to k minus one to the left and to the right. And the same with this primed one. It also appears at some other cut. Uh, and it's of length at most two to k minus one, so it's it is a part of this cut of length k because it spreads to the left and to the right of two to k minus one. So, in other words, we can say that this cut alpha k plus one around alpha is alpha k, and for some diff other cuts, beta k, we take some substring of that, and for some gamma. Uh, cut k, we also take some interval. OK, but this defines an SLP uh, composition system. OK, this defines a composition system in which those cuts uh, in the appropriately indexed, they are the non-terminal, um, they are the non-terminals. Moreover, if you look at alpha, logarithm of the length of the actual solution, then this is the whole solution as on u because, well, we take the, the whole length of it. Mm, maybe plus, well, maybe plus one because uh, that's the one side of alpha. Okay, so, and the size of this composition system, this is just, uh, well, uh, one plus log n uh, <coughs> times the number of cuts. So the number of cut, cuts is u u plus v plus two. So this is just n plus two, where n is the size of the size of the, uh, <coughs> size of the equation. OK, and this shows that there is a, uh, for the solution word, so also for it, of the variables, there is a small, small, SL, small composition system, so also a small SLP. OK, mm, yeah, and this shown this theorem. So how to improve it? So how to get a p-space solution? <clears throat> because that the, the previous one it, it just showed that the SLP is small, but it gave no 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 possible bound on the uh, on this SLP. So the idea is that what we showed so far what we showed so far is that there is a small SLP, and we showed it by building it top down. So we started from the whole word, and then we somehow produced this SLP using some properties of the word. Okay, but maybe what we are doing in a sense is that we are trying, we will be trying to build it from bottom up. So what happens at the very bottom of this SLP is that there are just some two, if it's in Chomsky normal form, it's that there are just two letters which are, well, there is a rule which defines some two letters or there is a, well, those could be the same or some different letters. <clears throat> okay, so we will be using just those simple rules A, B, well, something into goes into AB or something, or two letters AA, and we will try to build that this SLP bottom up. <clears throat> okay, so more formally, I will call that some two letters AB are a pair, and usually I will assume that those that the A is different than B. Okay, so a pair is a two letters AB, which are different. And this doesn't really work for AA because those AAs could overlap and then there is a problem. So uh, I will tell, say that A to L is a maximal block. Uh, well, if it exists somewhere in the word and it cannot be extended. So for instance, A to three B, A squared C, we have one maximal block A to three and one maximal block A squared because they cannot be extended in this word. Okay, and the per compression for AB in the word W, it just replaces all occurrences of this AB. 
within this word. Okay, with some fresh letter which doesn't appear in the word. And for the block compression, and this is well defined, those pairs do not overlap, so we can do it for all of those occurrences. And for the block compression, we take every possible occurrence of this uh, of maximal block of A's. And for all more possible L's, we replace all those blocks in parallel, okay? <clears throat> With some fresh letter A to L. Those are different for different maximal occurrences. And uh, this L here suggests that there is some connection between the, the letters and the lengths of the blocks that they replaced, but this is just a naming convention that we know what we are talking about, okay? So the algorithm doesn't know what those L's are. It just uses some fresh letters. <clears throat> so for instance, if there is A, B, A, 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 B, A, A, if we make the pair compression of A, B, then there are two occurrences of this A, B, and then we would get some word A, C, C, A, A, C, A, A. <coughs> this is for the pair compression A, B. And if we make the A block compression, uh, that's not well, then we would get A, B, A3, B, A2. Uh, okay, there are no two instances of A squared, so let's say there is A, A, A. Well, then we would get um, this block compression from this word. Okay, so there are two instances of the same letter A because there were two identical maximal blocks. Okay, and if we, of course, if we iterate this procedure, so just making this compression for different pairs or for different maximal blocks, then in the end we will reduce a word to a single letter. And what we are doing is we are just making an SLP, well, bottom up. So those compressions are actually the inverses of the uh, <coughs> of the rules of the SLPs, but we are doing them while looking at the at the actual word. Okay, and we want to do it on the solution word. So we have a word equation and we want to make the compression of the solution word using those two <coughs> different operations. But the problem is that first of all, we do not know the, uh, the uh, <laughs> we do not know the uh, solution word. And secondly, well, it's not necessarily can be done always. Okay, so um, we will be doing a non-deterministic algorithm. Okay, so it will make some non-deterministic choices. So it's important to understand how the non-deterministic algorithm works. And there are two things about non-deterministic algorithms. That first is that it is sound. So in our instance, when we work on word equations, it means that it cannot spoil anything. So if, you, if it is given an unsatisfiable equation, so whatever it does, it cannot transform it to a satisfiable one. Okay, so if you if it if it's giving a wrong equation, it will always return a wrong equation. And the, on the other hand, it is complete. It means that if it guesses correctly, then it will still get a valid equation. So if it if it gets a valid equation, uh, satisfiable equation, and if it guesses correctly, then it will get a satisfiable equation. Okay, if it guesses wrongly, then of course it could spoil the equation. But what's important is that for some guesses, it will find it it will still get a satisfiable equation. And of course, by the <clears throat> if you look how this is defined, if we have several sub procedures, then if we compose them, then if all of them are sound or complete, then in the end, we will get a sound or complete sub -proce uh, procedure in total. Okay, so it's important to show just for the sub procedures that they are sound or complete. <clears throat> and being sound is a very general notion. So essentially, whatever you do on the, the equation, it will still be sound. So if you, for instance, if you take a variable and you replace it with some variable, well, you change the solution so that you some pop the, some prefix w and some suffix w prime or out of x, then it's <coughs> sound. Because if the new equation has a solution, then you could also get a solution of the previous equation by just appending w and prepending w and appending W prime at the end. Uh, or you could just delete a variable. So if you have a, a variable x, a variable x, then you could replace it by some word w. And again, this is sound because if you have a new solution, <clears throat> if you have a solution of this new equation, then you just add a substitution <coughs> w for x for the for the old equation, and this is still uh, a solution. Moreover, if we replace some 
I, w- I would usually think that all of them, but if you, in principle, if you replace some occurrences of some of a word with some fresh letter C, fresh meaning that it doesn't appear anywhere in the equation, uh, then this is also sound because if you have a solution of the of the new equation, it perhaps uses this letter C, then you can form the solution of the old equation by replacing every possible C back with this word W, okay? The C is fresh, so it doesn't appear anywhere else. It could all, only be as a substitution for the uh, for, uh, for the substitution for this W. Uh, okay. So how to compress the pairs? So in some cases and, and blocks, it's easy to see that uh, we are doing it. Uh, it's easy to do it properly, and this is related to the notion of being explicit, implicit, or crossing. So. If we are giving us an equation and some substitution, usually it is a solution, but let's say it's just a substitution. Uh, then if we look at the solution word S on U and S on, S on V, then there are, and, and it has some substring W, there are well, a couple of ways, three ways how we can get it from the, how it can be part of the solution word. First of all, it could be that it is already in the equation. So all those letters of W already in the equation. And then I will say that this W and the solution, that this occurrence of W is explicit, meaning that all the letters are in the equation. It could be implicit, meaning that all the letters come from the substitution for the variable. <coughs> okay, so it's not in the equation at all. Or it could be crossing, and this is the most important part, meaning that's neither of the above. So some of the letters are from the substitution for a variable, and some of other letters are from the equation or from substitution for some other variable. Okay, and the pair, uh, like A, B, is going to be, um, well, substring, but in general, and some string, <coughs> not the substring of the equation, but the string in general is, I will say it is crossing <coughs> with respect to some solution, because this notion is defined with respect to a solution, if it has at least one crossing occurrence. Okay, this, those are the bad things that can happen, that there are the crossing occurrences. And it's non-crossing otherwise, so all of its occurrences, each of its occurrences is either explicit or implicit. Okay, and putting it more concretely into our setting of pairs and blocks, then a, a, B, a, pair, a, B is a crossing pair if it's, well, it, it has at least crossing occurrence with respect to the solution, <coughs> and A has a crossing block if at least one maximal block of A is crossing, well, with respect to this solution, uh, substitution. <coughs> okay, so maybe on an example, uh, this is one of the strings that, well, word equations that we considered before. And when we substitute x with this and y with this, then we get a true equality, hopefully. So if we substitute, we get this solution word BAA, BAA, for y it's BBAB. <coughs> and for instance, this is a crossing occurrence because it's in between x and, and b. So AB is crossing. Uh, this is also crossing, and it's again a b. For instance, everything which is on the right-hand side, it's it's explicit. This is explicit. This is explicit. So th- this is an explicit occurrences occurrences uh, occurrence of a b. There are no implicit occurrence of a b because there are no in the substitution for the variables. But this is, for instance, implicit, and it occurs here. It also occurs here or here. So there are several implicit occurrences of 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 BA. Uh, For the blocks, they all only have, this is an explicit one, this is explicit one. This one is explicit because it comes from a substitution for a variable here. And there is no crossing block uh, because this was how the equation was done. But for instance, if we add one B here and we add one B to X, then here there would be another B and this would would be a crossing um, maximum. Well, a crossing block block of Bs, okay, and then B would have crossing blocks, but as written before, there were no no crossing blocks. <coughs> okay, <coughs> so if uh, and there cannot be too many crossing uh, crossing crossing pairs and crossing blocks, because for a pair to be crossing, well, there needs to be an occurrence of a of a variable, and there is some letter or another variable to the left, and there is something. Uh, well, on the crossing between the, the variable and something else. So since there are 
at most n occurrences of variables, then counting to the left and to the right, we have at most two different, two n different substring which can be crossing. Uh, pairs and, and blocks which can be crossing. So one such crossing cannot be used twice because it's either a pair or, or a block. This is done for a fixed solution S. Okay, so there's only one choice for one side of the variable. Uh, okay, so and those can be used as uh, for the compression. So when the pair or a block is non non crossing, then compressing it is a no brainer. Okay, so if for instance for the pair if we assume that it is non-crossing, then we just take a new letter and we replace every explicit occurrence in the equation by this new letter. Okay, for the same for blocks, but we just need to do it in parallel for many maximal, uh, for many, for different maximal blocks. So we just take new letters for every possible L which occurs in the equation and we replace them, all those maximal occurrences uh, of maximal A, A blocks with new letters, well, consequently, so if there are two a, a square here and a square here, then we replace it with the same letter. <clears throat> For instance, again, in this equation, so uh, as you probably recall, a, b is crossing. So if we try to replace it, then it wouldn't do anything on the left-hand side because there's no a, b on the left-hand side, but on the right-hand side, there are a, b, so this doesn't work, but b, a is non-crossing. So for instance, if we replace BA, then we would replace this BA, this BA, this BA with C. And we replace this one here with C and this one here with C. And you can we can just check that if we substitute it, then this is C AA for X uh, here as well. So C A for Y, this is B C B. And on the left hand side, it's again C A A C uh, a, B, C, B, and hopefully those are the same. <coughs> okay, uh, the same. For the block compression, for instance, for the A block compression, uh, well, this is one block of A, this is another block of A. For, for a single A, we do not do the compression because it's just the same letter, there's no point on that. Uh, and there is a block of A, this is a block of A. And again, if we replace it, then well, we do two replacement on the left hand side, two replacement on the right hand side, and we can check that this is indeed <coughs> well defined. Okay, and uh, the claim is firstly that, uh, well, for the pair compression first, that this uh, sub procedure is sound. And of course, it's sound because we, we listed a couple of operations which and said that all of them are uh, it's just a composition of some. Um, Previously, we gave some prop, uh, some simple examples of operations which are sound, and those were among them. So replacing some substrings, and this is all that we do. Okay, so the sound. But what's more important is that if A B is non-crossing for a fixed solution, uh, then uh, this is complete. So the new equation that we get has a solution, and moreover, this solution is well, intuitively, we should understand how it looks. So the solution word is obtained by replacing every AB in this original uh, uh, solution word, okay? So this new word, solution word S prime on U prime is obtained by replacing every AB in this old solution word S on U. <coughs> okay, and the same holds for, for, for block compression. So it is sound, and if there is a solution for which it is non-crossing, then this new the, the new equation is uh, also satisfiable and they correspond in the sense that this is the, the new solution word is obtained by by compressing. <coughs> Moreover, uh, what will be important somehow later on is that if we make any compression on this equation, uh, for instance, the equation differs, then the new solution is different. Well, the new solution word is shorter than the previous one. So if we make any compression, then of course the solution word gets shorter. Okay, so and we know about the compression which are done on, on the equation. So if the equation is different, then we made some compression, so the solution words are, are shorter. And mm, the proof, there should be some proof. Okay, and the proof is easy because when look at all occurrences of A B. 
look at occurrences of AB. So this was essentially done on the example previously. So we look at the occurrences of AB. There are some implicit ones uh, in solution word in S on U and the same in S on, on W. So there are implicit occurrences and they are replaced. With C because, uh, well, we change the solution. Change the solution. We define this S prime in the sense that S prime on X is the S on X with AB replaced by C. So if there is an implicit occurrence of AB, then it was replaced because we defined the new, the new substitution in this way. If it was explicit, <coughs> then it was replaced by the algorithm. So this is the only thing that, that the algorithm does. If there is an explicit occurrence, then it replaces the, the AB. And finally, if there is a crossing occurrence, uh, no such. Okay, so the assumption of the lemma says that there is no crossing occurrence. So if there is no crossing occurrence, then we do not need to consider that. Okay, so what we've showed is that every, <coughs> for this new solution S prime, which we defined by, which is well defined because those ABs do not um, overlap, that every possible uh, occurrence of AB in the solution word was replaced either by changing the solution or by the, actually by the algorithm. Okay, the only problematic case would, could be the crossing ones, but we assume that there are none of them. And the proof for the uh, block compression is exactly the same. So just by, well, again, we consider implicit, explicit, and crossing. Okay, but this is the easy case because whatever we do, when we look at the equation, <coughs> there will be crossing occurrences, either of blocks or, or, of, or of some pairs. But why there is a crossing occurrence? Well, it is because we have, for instance, some AX and the solution for X, it applies substitute B and something else. So there's this, the problem with this B, which, are, which is at the beginning of the X, and there's an easy fix how to do it. If there is such a B, then we just push it out. Okay, we do not even have to look whether there is an A in front. We know that if there is a B as the leading letter of X, then we just push it out because there is potentially a problem with because it might create a, a crossing pair. Okay, so the algorithm is going to look at every possible variable one by one and just guess non-deterministically because there is no way of knowing that whether the first letter of the substitution is indeed B. And if so, then it will pop this letter out. It will replace X by BX. There is this, <coughs> it changes the solution implicitly. So it used to be BW, now it should be W. Uh, there is this special case that if now the substitution for the variable is empty, then we just remove the X from, from, the, from the equation. Alternatively, here we could replace it by BX or by B, meaning that we just delete X entirely. Okay, and then we do a symmetric action uh, for the other one. So we look at uh, X and we look whether the substitution for X is the last letter is A, which would also be <coughs> a problem. And if so, then we pop out this A and then we delete X if it now the substitution for X is empty. Uh, okay, so the qu claim is that this procedure is sound. This is true because it again uses just those simple operations for which we already told that it's sound and also that it's complete in the sense uh, <coughs> um, for, for some choices. And uh, more specifically, if we choose appropriately, then we get a solution for the new equation, we get a sub solution which results in the same solution word and moreover, AB is non-crossing. And those choices are exactly, well, here we have the true choices. True choices in the sense that if we look at the substitution for X, this is somewhat W, if it begins with B, then we should pop it out. If it adds, ends with A, then we should pop it out. And if it begins with some other letters, then we do not, do not modify it, okay? And then if W is empty, then we should delete the, the X. Uh, and why AB is there non-crossing? So, if it's crossing, then it means that there is some variable and we we do it for the true choices. So the substitution for X is non-empty because otherwise we would have deleted it. So for it to be 
define um, a b to be crossing then it means that there is b here as the last letter and a here so what happened with x when we consider it if we popped b so this means that it cannot be there is there is an a to the to the left because we popped b so there was there is a letter b there if we did not pop b so this means that the first letter of x is not b okay because we have not popped it so if you look at this condition why it's crossing then it means that it cannot be that the first letter of x is b because we would have popped it and we didn't so it's not b which means that this case cannot give you a, a crossing pair and the same happens on the right hand side there is a symmetric argument okay so maybe on the on the instance if we want to make a b non crossing so what happens is that this a this b and actually also this b and this a all of those fall into this category of those proper choices so we should replace x with we replace x with b x a and y we replace with uh, also with b y a and we can look that all of those occurrences of the a b which were crossing on the left hand side one of those were here the other here and the third here all of them are now non crossing because they are actually all of them became now explicit in the equation actually popping this b was not needed for anything because there is no a to the left that is not problem not a problem we just did it for the sake of it <clears throat> uh, sorry okay and the proof uh, so what to do with prefixes and suffixes well uh, imagine there is just a x then popping one a to the left of x is might be not enough because there still could be some maximal block of a's which is to the left and now just one letter more is on the left hand side uh, is outside of x so what we should do we should iterate until all those x's end or on in other words we should guess the length of the a prefix so the <coughs> maximal prefix which consists solely of a's on the left uh, of substitution for x and the length of the maximal a suffix and replace this x with well a to lx x a to rx there are some special cases that x could become empty then be deleted or uh, if if we delete a then we do not need two variables we just take one but all of those are just some not important special cases okay the problematic part here is that this l to x and rx those could be very large in principle we do not know how large uh, but uh, we know from some well-known lemma which we will show later on hopefully tomorrow is that this in length minimal solution this lx are rx are at most exponential uh, at most exponential which means that we can write them down using uh, polynomial space and we will compress them shortly afterwards so this temporary larger space consumption is not a problem okay we will use a, <coughs> some extra linear space but it will be freed in a moment okay so that's that's fine uh, and again this procedure is sound which is easy because it's a composition of simple sound procedure but it's also complete so if we make proper choices so the true choices for some solution then afterwards we will get uh, a word equation which has a a new sub a new solution which defines the same solution word and moreover a has no a has no crossing blocks this one that it doesn't have crossing blocks is actually easier than, than previously because we when we popped all this a prefix then the next letter is some letter b which is no longer a so after this popping a uh, no variable has uh, a as the first or last letter so there couldn't be any any crossing blocks of, of a anyway okay and again those lengths this lx and rx when we look at length minimal solutions they could be at most exponential okay so we can uh, write them down using some smaller space so we depend on this previous lemma but it's not so difficult and we will show it essentially tomorrow <laughs> okay so those are all the sub procedures that we need uh, there are some uh, as usually there are some degenerate cases for instance when we look at the equation x y equals y z and there are no variable no no letters in the equation then this boils down to Diophantine equations. 
equations because what if there is a solution there is a solution of the form y to a that which to a variable x assigns a to x to variable y a to some small y and so on so it's just enough to solve a system of Diophantine equations uh, so the equations on, on the lens and this can be done in uh, in NP and the same holds if there is only one letter in the var uh, in the equation okay so if <coughs> all the one in the sense uh, a not one occurrence of the letter but just one letter like y z then it's the same so we still can get substitute anything with um, with a to, with blocks of a so again this degenerates to a system of <coughs> uh, to a system of diophant and equations okay so in the following i will always assume that the equation has at least two different letters because otherwise we already know that this is simple okay so what the uh, algorithm does it just lists the letters which are in the equation and we know from this lemma about the Plandowski part or, but also can be proved directly that if there is a solution then there is a solution over L okay so we do not need to lead to use the letters which are at, which are not used by the equation okay every other letter could be just changed by a letter from from the equation and this would still be a solution Okay, other, afterwards we choose whether we want to compress pairs, some pair using of, of those two letters uh, from the equation, <clears throat> or maybe we want to compress blocks of some letter from the equation. And then we, uh, so this should be P, and then we guess whether, ah, uh, sorry, this should be pop on P. Okay, so we check whether it's crossing. If it's a crossing as a pair, then we pop A and pop, uh, well, pop B to the left and pop A to the right from appropriate variables. If it's crossing as a letter, then again, we uncross blocks of the letter and then we make appropriate compression. So either block compression or pair compression. So this was written in this form so that it's more uh, uniform, but perhaps, uh, okay. We choose what to compress, a pair or blocks. If it's needed, then we uncross it and then we compress it okay and we just iterate this procedure until the moment in which both sides are of length one which means that they are trivial either it's a equals b and then it's not satisfiable and otherwise it's satisfiable okay and clearly all those procedures are, are sound because everything here was sound so if we at some point we find a solution then indeed there was a solution at the beginning <coughs> it's also complete because all those sub procedures are also complete but what we need <clears throat> and we know that if we compress anything then the uh, length of solutions uh, of solution word decreases so if we make any compression then the length of the then the length of the solution word decreases we might replace one solution by a shorter so the length minimal one but the length of the solution decreases all the time. So what we only need to show is the p-space bound. Okay, so to show that uh, for appropriate choices, we never exceed some polynomial space. Okay, otherwise everything here is sound, it's complete, and we decrease the length of the uh, of this length minimal solution. So we will eventually found the, uh, we will eventually terminate. Okay, so uh, I will give you the bound, I will try to, well, I will give a quadratic bound. Okay, so the first case is if there is a non-crossing pair, non-crossing pair or block, then we choose it, then choose it. Okay, so if among the pairs that we have listed, there is a non-crossing pair or there is a block of A's which is non-crossing, non then we choose it because it uh, shortens, the sol shortens the equation, right? Because we make some compression on the equation, so the equation only gets shorter and the solution gets shorter, everything is better. So those non-crossing compressions are the, are the no-brainers. Okay, so the real case that we need to compress is that only, they're only crossing pairs and blocks. 
Okay, but we know that there are at most two n of them because the number of variables never increases. Well, the number of occurrences of variable never increases. The original equation was all, was of length n, so there are at most two different, <coughs> at most two n, different crossing pairs and blocks. Okay, so there will be a random bound now. So if say the equation is of length uh, at most, the bound that we are, are going to prove here is actually concrete eight n squared plus 3n plus 2. So if our equation is of length at most 8n plus n plus 2, then just choose anything. <coughs> For compression, because the uncrossing introduces at most 2n new letters. Okay, so we pop to the left and for the compression of pairs, we popped one letter to the right and one letter to the late, left from each variable. Uh, for the blocks, we perhaps pop very long blocks to the left and right of the variable, but we will immediately afterward compress them. So we will replace them with, with one letter, uh, some A to L afterwards. So we can think that this is just one in, uh, that we instantly pop and compress and then it means that we pop at most one letter to the left and right from each variable. So we, intro we introduce at most two n new letters. We used to have eight n plus n plus two. So after this addition, we still have at most eight n plus three n plus two. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm squared. It's uh, squared. Yes. Oh, eight n squared. Right. Yes. Okay, so the only uh, remaining case, and that's the trivial one, is that the equation is long. So the equation has at least 8n squared plus 3n plus two letters. And all of them all are in crossing, crossing pairs or blocks, are in occurrences of crossing pairs and blocks. But there are at most two n of them. So there is a crossing pair. There exists a crossing pair or block no, such that it has at, at least 8n squared plus 3n plus 2 divided by 2n letters. Okay, so that its occurrences use at least this amount of letters in the equation. Okay, every letter in the equation is assigned to at least one crossing pair of blocks. So this bound is well, some uh, some crossing pair of block will use this number of letters. So in the compression, it will use at, it will lose at least half of those letters. Okay, compression of this pair. Or block. Well, it removes well half of that letters, eight n squared plus three n plus two divided by four n. Well, and this is roughly two n oh, plus something. Okay, but it removes two n at least two n letters. Okay, so the uncrossing adds at most two letters, and compression <coughs> removes at least two n letters, which means that if the equation is of at least this length, then the compression will make this equation shorter. Okay, because we add at mo compression of this pair or, or block, because it removes at least, adds at most two n letters and removes at least two n letters, so we will make it smaller, which means by an easy induction, which, which we want to show that if we make appropriate choices, then our equation all the time will be of at most, uh, at most this length. Uh, sorry, sorry, it should not be like that. It should be plus, plus n. Uh, okay, plus. Okay, because if we are below the bound 8n squared plus n, 
then we after the compression will still be here and if we are above this bound a ten squared plus n that we will be get smaller so we will get uh, we will not make the equ equation larger so we will still get below below this bound um, I might mess up the a constant a little bit but the, the fact is the same so if the equation is, is only quadratic then we will if it increases then we will <coughs> there is always a pair which it re removes a fraction of 1 over 2n of letters so at some point we, we cannot exceed some bound we can always choose the one which will be which will be below this, this quadratic bound okay and that's it we know that it's sound it's complete and we know that for those choices uh, we are all we can always make the choice which is below some eight eight n squared plus some additional linear <coughs> fraction of letters so uh, but the like length of the op op optimal path is still exponential yes yes it could optimal. be exponential yes i mean optimal path of compressions yes it could be that the path is of exponential length because the device will be in p i think uh the same proof is to say this is in p yes so that's uh, what i plan for open problems is that what we can squeeze is that uh, it requires some argument but the, the length of the path is at most exponential so what we produce is that uh, the we can show that the size of the smallest solution is at most doubly exponential in this uh, plandowski algorithm work proportionally to logarithm of n so and this is the same what we do uh, okay so we uh, since the, we we get only a bound of double exponential so we do not get an np bound but if we for any reason were able to give an exponential upper bound then we would have an np algorithm both for this variant of plandowski and Ritten, but also for for that one and we do not know whether this is true <coughs> or not in the sense that uh, the largest example of solutions to to word equations are of only exponential size so we do not know of anything which is super exponential not to mention doubly exponential and it's widely believed that it should be at most exponential and the whole problem should be in, in np okay thank you so if there are any questions i please ask but otherwise uh, this was what i wanted to say today well so i think it would be very nice to have because all these ideas well they are individually understandable but uh it would be so nice to have an illustration and i remember you have been telling me some years ago that uh i think you wanted to recruit some student who will implement this or something like that didn't work didn't work but i'm not sure if uh, implementation is going to give you any additional insight well uh, it uh, well at least it would allow you to generate some example which is probably well would take too much time to do by hand mm -hmm. that's true yes but of course you can make an example by hand uh, it's, i'm not so sure whether there are any very nice examples generated by hand well i guess you should have any every component of the solution to be used exactly one something like that well right well just a just a stupid question so you locate non-crossing a crossing pair so an a b is a crossing pair if every some variable is preceded by a or followed by b right um <clears throat> Uh, no. no, so whether something is a crossing pair or not, this is made by a non-deterministic choice. Ah, I see. Because you, you have no idea of knowing what's the first letter of the substitution. But let us see. Yes, but let us say that. Yes. All right. But so if some variable, if if no variable is preceded by A and no variable is followed by B, then, then it is certainly not crossing, but yes. you cannot rely upon no. that, this deterministic condition. Um, we assume that no variable is uh, assigned an epsilon uh, 
okay so every variable is assigned some <clears throat> there's also the possibility that you have x y and there is uh, no a crossing bar between x and y right yes of course of course yes although so, this, this very rarely happens because uh, we pop the letters all the time so <clears throat> you at the very beginning it could be that there is nothing uh, that there are two variables uh, with nothing in between but very quickly we will get letters in between any two variables yes yes of course so nothing deterministic at all but of course it's not it wasn't planned uh, anyway I see. Well, uh, yes, and of course, I uh, yes, I should say that all that I said about the transformation to Chomsky normal form is, of course, not applicable to SLPs. So my example, it used a grammar without cycles. A grammar without cycles can still cause a square blow up, but SLP is something uh, so simple you don't have this junction. So of course you, uh, well, of course you can have a linear. Uh, um, well, just a, well, a linear transformation, a transformation that increases the size only linearly. Yes. Yes. Well, so that's all with my questions.